Okay. Um, uh, let's go on to our next presentation. Uh, again, uh, Joel Sneakloth is with uh, Colorado State University also. Uh, he's, uh, he's actually located in uh, North Platte. And um, no, I'm actually located in Akron. I used to be North oh, Platte you're, years ago. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Joel. Um, anyway, uh, Joel works in the, as a water resource extension uh, specialist. And, and one of the things that we've talked about uh, when Jim Waggle was with extension years ago is that we always had some questions about some of our soil classification that if we used reduced tillage or residue management, if we could change some of the irrigation characteristics of some of our, some of our soil. So Joel has been doing research on, on the impact of uh, residue management under irrigation. So Joel, I'll turn it over to you. You see my screen? Yes, it's okay. up. Now you guys are getting the uh, crash course. This is actually about an hour and 20 minute talk if you really want to get into this detail. So you're getting a crash course. <laughs> yeah. so working on this, this is a uh, project we've been working on since 2014. You know, take a couple of years to get set up and everything. But it's been very interesting. There's been things we've learned that we thought were gonna happen, things we did, didn't think were gonna happen. Uh, so it's the good, bad, and the ugly at times. So. We're going to get to going here, but one of the reasons we started this was uh, we do have a lot of residue harvest within this area. I'm in a ba two basins. One is the South Platte and what the other one is partly Ogallala. Uh, so we cover 40% of the irrigated acres within the Colorado, in these two basins. And we also have a large livestock industry, both dairy, beef, uh, as in the, that aspect. I mean, we have three feedlots. That range from 100,000 to 150,000 head, numerous 20 to 30,000 head. And I don't even know how many dairies we have that are over 1,500 cows. So they take a lot of forage as well as bedding. Uh, and then with, with the cellulose, not the, with the ethanol industry, I mean, one of the primary feed sources they like is stover. Works very well with it. So we do have those issues where there are harvestings stocks at the end of the year after grain harvest and they don't take into consideration what the impacts are so we've started this study looking at that you know water infiltration rates what happens with it um and soil moisture we have evaporative losses and that can be reduced significantly during portions of the year by residue cover and also capture snow and i'm sure in north dakota you, all your snowfalls just come down so nice and pretty straight down, you know, here in Colorado, they come sideways. Uh, <laughs> so we're looking at that, and that's the previous research. And then in season, evapotranspiration. Time periods where the, the residue has the most impact, and you would, as you would expect, it's early vegetative growth period through early reproductive. And then, of course, economics is the yield. What, what are you looking at for yield potential? Uh, so these were started in 2014. Uh, conventional corn and the plots were previously conventional till for the previous six years that we had this and on this area. So it's a long term no till or long term continuous corn rotation here, relative. But we also installed two tillage treatments no till and tillage. And the tillage is a, a tandem disc that we utilize in the spring uh, after the right prior to heart or planting about two to three weeks if we can. Uh, No-till, we've kind of gone a little bit more to strip-till, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, over there because of some of the issues we have. And then we harvest the residue or let the residue remain in the field standing over the winter. So we do our harvest as soon as the corn is out of the field. We go and rake the stalks as best as we can, uh, bale it, get it off the field. And so we have that overwinter time period where we have no residue or residue. Uh, so we're looking at this, and 34,000 is our typical plant population. But one of the things we learned right away was we're not seeing the impacts fast enough that we want to see. So we limited irrigation to a maximum of 10 inches. That's about 70% of our typical irrigation practices right here in Akron with our soil types of precipitation in that. Uh, so we did manage the no-till slightly different. We after a couple of years of data, we took that down. We limited that to nine. 
So remember, you're already having a 10% savings on irrigation. You'll see what the yields are like here. But this is typically what we look at, 95% cover where we have the no-till uh, leaving all the residue. No-till where we took off the residue, you're not getting it all. We still have about a 30% cover, so it's still conservation compliant. Uh, tilled with residue, we're make, trying to maintain 50 to 70% cover at planting uh, with the tillage. And tilled, no residue, you know, we're down to 10% cover by the time you incorporate that residue, that, even with just one pass. You've gone from 30% down to 10% cover. Uh, snow capture, you know, it's what is the impact of fall tillage, residue harvest, snow capture? You know, important of snow capture because right here, we're in a water limited situation, especially in the Ogallala aquifer system. We're losing capacity, we're losing volume, declines over time. In the South Platte, it's more of variability year to year snowpack because that's all how our water delivery in the South Platte is all based off of snowpack. And we also have one other nasty little thing that we deal with, and that's the front range keep buying water and they're consuming more water over time. So this is what we look at when we talk about residue and snow capture. Uh, this is one of the years where we had, this was not a bad blizzard. I mean, it was minor snowstorm, I would classify. We had four to five inches of snow with probably 30 mile an hour winds. But you can see the next day when I was able to get, dig out and get to the fields, you can see the residue stopped the snow within the field where we did not have residue, it blew off. It's into the road ditches, uh, neighbor's field or wherever, or into your next field that actually has residue. So that can be a significant impact on it. So we're talking about precipitation storage efficiency. So we look at how much do we capture in the soil from harvest to pre-planting, and divide that by how much moisture actually fell. You know, you're not gonna have 100% efficiency uh, in capture precipitation, but in year 2017, we look at the no-till, no residues, or no residues, you know, we're talking, you know, a little under 40%, you know, here about 30%, but where we look at where we had the residue, you know, we're above 50% on average. So here, till, no residue, no residue. We look at 2018, Again, very similar numbers. Actually, we had slightly higher capture where we had the residue. You know, it looks almost close to pushing 60% capture. Uh, and then in 2019, it was actually a low precipitation year. We had small events continuously. Uh, it actually was closer, close to average, slightly below average. But again, when you get these small events and then have a long time period in between uh, to evaporate that sweat water, we were down less than 20% water capture over the winter compared to residue, where we had the residue, we were still above 50%. So in an average year, I think that year, we were about an inch and a half, almost two inches more precip stored soil moisture going into 2019, where we left the residue as compared to where we took the residue off. So beginning soil moisture, and this tracks it, and we're in a limited water situation, so we expect declining water contents at the beginning of the year. But you look at the differences here, you know, beginning here, 10, 9, 9, 9 in 2016, 2017, 9 inches, uh, closer to 7, eh, 7 and a half, and sub 6, where we took the residues off. And then again, in 2018, uh, about 7 inches. Look at the no-till no where we took the residue off, we're sub five inch. Again, where we had left the residue on, uh, we're about that seven inch. And again, where we tilled and took the residue off, we're sub five or we're close to five inches. So you can see the impact of that residue management over the winter is having significant impact on beginning soil moisture. Uh, of course, we also did infiltration at the end of the growing season, primarily about mid-September. Mid uh, during that time period. And if you ever want to have some fun, go out into the field, use a Cornell infiltrometer. You'll have the greatest time of your life. <laughs> uh, fall measurement only, greatest impact because we've had all the impact of irrigation throughout the growing season. Any major precipitation of events, high intensity, having impacts on those soil surfaces. We can generate an infiltration curve. We can monitor total water infiltrated over a 30 minute period. We can estimate measure time to first runoff. We can also measure, estimate steady state infiltration. And why is infiltration important? You know, going through there. So 
we're going to talk about this with we're going to actually use the, the five years that we have infiltration so 2014 the very first year we started this we were going well gee one year into this boy look at that difference with residue management compared to re residue harvesting uh year number two here's one of the things we say well no-till should be improving more but the no tillage actually improved more in the second year and you can see what happens with the residue harvested the differences were not as great on, on that 2015 2016 everything went down we actually had a fairly significant high intensity precipitation event in this year uh, and that impacts the soil surface so we're averaging total infiltration over 30 minutes you know sub three inch here where the no-till no residue and this is one of the things we looked at it's sub two inch in 30 minutes 2017 look at the difference again no till tilled were all about the same in the, each of those two years but again the no till no residue which we kind of thought at one time that may be the better way to go compared to tilled uh, because you're not disturbing that soil surface but if, again that's infiltration is maintained by that top millimeter of soil and when you keep taking the residue off you're not mixing it that top millimeter gets weathered very fast 2018 here we again we see no-till was the best with all the residue and the three other treatments where we either tilled took the residue off were all fairly close to the same uh, again total infiltration over the average you know it's not a significant impact really tilled with residue and the high conservation compliance compared to no-till uh, again the tilled with no res no-till with no residue was by far the worst now steady state infiltration we, we how we estimated this was we took the last three readings about the last six to nine minutes of readings and if we saw it staying steady steady over at that time period we averaged those three readings and the major impact here we'll just go right here to the end average no till maintains in those last nine eight to nine minutes significantly higher infiltration compared to the other three treatments till no till and why is that we have structure below the soil surface that's improving it now statistically it didn't show it in this but i think uh most farmers say 20 percent chance i'll take that as significant <laughs> scientifically we'd say no nah, we're getting close but we're not there these are some of the infiltration curves that we've developed and this is over time so this is from taking our first reading at one minute we did the first six minutes one minute readings and after that we did three minute readings so you can see how much water is infiltrated over that time period in, in centimeters per hour take centimeters divided by 2.5 you have inches so here's two inches four inches uh six inches and eight inches you see very high infiltration but right off the bat you see where the residue removals drop significantly during this first five to six minutes compared to where we leave the residue on and we can see those happening why is an infiltration curve important you can develop what you need for a sprinkler package design based off of these type of infiltration curves so if we look at a 600 gallon minute well 15 foot wetted diameter this is the application pattern that you would see on it so where we see potential for runoff it's this area where we have the note till we leave all the residue on this is potential runoff and that's now potential depending upon your soil slopes your storage surface storage impacts then we can look at where we take the residue off what's the increase in potential uh, we had farmers this last year we showed this type of data in, a, in an intensive irrigation management one uh, they were looking at us well we always thought you know keeping our canopy water in the canopy is significant savings I said no runoff can become a major one because I didn't show them a five foot wetted diameter where you're in in canopy and that is you know you're looking at infiltration or applications peaking up in this area in a much shorter time curve and they did some major re-nozzling this year over this year and talking with them over the phone because of COVID they were very happy they said this is some of the best looking corn that they had most uniform looking corn that they've had in years since they did this so irrigation sprinklers and designing a sprinkler package for an irrigation system these greater infiltration rates you can either keep maintain it and keep the less runoff but if you don't have runoff issues 
you can start to look at smaller wetted diameters, lower operating pressures means less operating costs, as long as you can maintain uniformity within the system. But again, the key component here is maintaining or minimizing runoff. Uh, and what do I say is runoff? If water moves five feet, it's runoff. It's not where you want it. Uh, I prefer maintaining less than a foot, any water movement within a foot or less uh, with ponding. So the early infiltration is set by, primarily by the soil surface structure. That's what we're seeing with that no-till, no residue. Uh, it's very, getting to be very weathered at this point in time, uh, but it's going to be very highly variable year to year. Steady state that appears to be set by the soil structure below the surface. That's what we're seeing with the no-till. We're seeing more macro pore structure, earthworm structure within that system. And we also are seeing some compaction. The compaction wasn't in here. They had to get cut. Uh, evaporation, you know, because we're talk talking about try trying to reduce evaporate. How do we manage that? And how do we know how to manage that? You know, so what residue cover is needed to reduce evaporative losses? Some people say, well, 50% cover will reduce our evaporation losses. Uh, the research shows we have to have as close to 100% cover as possible to, to reduce evaporative losses. Some of the work done in Kansas and Nebraska says shows even a reduction of 25% going to 75% cover does not significantly reduce evaporative losses compared to a bare soil surface. Uh, I got a couple more vegetative water use because we said we're talking about what the retiming. All what we find is the retiming of that evaporation is primarily during vegetative to pre-tassel, uh, anywhere from a three quarters of an inch savings to an inch 20 save, inch two tenths savings within those years, and that is significant. Uh, this year, we actually saw closer to an inch and a half savings with the high evaporative yields. Now, we go back to what economics, because this is where it all plays. You can't have those. And we have some problems with our soils. We're high pH. So cool weather in the spring, high pH, chlorosis issues. Uh, but what we're seeing with the nine inches over these average equal yields with no till with residue compared to tilled with residue, and we're seeing significant declines in yields under these situations where we're limited to water, where we take the residue off. And that is that water conservation that we're looking at. Uh, I, it, on average, it's almost 20 bushel per acre reduction with residue removal. So when you're talking about residue removal, you have to factor that in to your economics. Some of the challenges, residue management does take more management uh, pre-planning. With our high pH soils, soil fertility, sulfur, iron, nitrogen, uh, we have to look at high, more because sulfur and iron are released more readily in a warmer soil temperatures. Uh, that's why we went to a little bit more strip till. We're placing sulfur and iron in a couple different locations now, below the seed, seed zone as well as in a two by two band with that. And the other reason was in that no till, no residue, uh, by 2019, I was having issues keeping a planter in the soil uh, and keeping engaged. I was actually having skips in 2019 that were showing up because my planter would lift out of the ground. So the soil surface was getting very compacted at that point. Nitrogen, because of the dynamics of residue decomposition, uh, one of the things you have to look at is more timing of that. With irrigation, we can irrigate more nitrogen on, but when we have those cooler soil temperatures, we don't want to irrigate a lot early. So putting a little bit more nitrogen on with planter is critical or even earlier than that. So again, that iron chlorosis is more pr prominent if you have high pH soils. We're running on these plots seven, nine to eight, two, and we're farming at 4,600 feet elevation. So we're halfway up the mountains here. <laughs> you know, so it's drip tilt, but it can impact it depending upon how aggressive you are. And some people are very aggressive with it. Weed management is another issue where we, we're seeing some benefits with residue. We're seeing less kosher in the, where we leave the residue, but it's also tougher to kill at times because of that residue. Uh, your herbicide gets intercepted by the residue rather than getting on the plants in that aspect. So with that, I think I got my 20 minutes in. <laughs> so fa the fast and the furious. Well, well thanks, Joel. Uh, actually, a lot of our uh soils in north dakota and not that much different and and the snow does move horizontally up here quite a bit we get a lot oh, of wind i've been in fog enough times in january to know that <laughs> <laughs> uh and i 
I was just checking the chat. Uh, if you if you got uh, anybody listening, if they got questions for Joel, just type in the chat or his contact information will be on there. You can get a hold of him. Uh, I think uh, with our glacial till soil, some of this information I think is very appropriate for it if people want to irrigate. Uh, that's been a lot of discussion in North Dakota with glacial till soils about uh, irrigation and uh, or not being able to irrigate it. So thanks, Joel. Uh, are you going to stay on?